Ask the Messengers, the program that deals with substance abuse, real people telling real stories. Hosted by Pastor Lester Lewis, co-host Charlize Wilkerson and Leroy Carey. Produced by David Humphreys. Where there is addiction, there is a chance for recovery. We're trying to help save lives on Ask the Messengers. Welcome to Ask the Messengers. My name is Pastor Lester Lewis and I am going to be your proud host for today's show. Ask the Messengers is a program that is about real people sharing their real stories, but most importantly, sharing how real deliverance is possible. And so today, we want you to know that one of the things we pride ourselves on here at Ask the Messengers is that this is not a scripted show. Uh, these are not actors. These are not actresses. These are not paid performers. These are individuals who actually went through the struggle of being addicted and have come out on the other side and recovery is now their testimony. One of the things we are, we're absolutely proud about is that we also uh, have some great community leaders and community organizations that are giving help to those who are seeking recovery. And today we have one of those great men of our community that we're going to interview today. It is Dr. Calvin Tripp. Now, Dr. Trent has a great resume, uh, but one of the things we want you to know is that he is the vice president of the Detroit Recovery Pro Project, and he's also the executive director of Real Michigan. And so he is doing great things in the community. He's doing great things to help those who are in need of recovery. And so today uh, we're going to have, we're going to go to Ask the Messengers producer, David Humphreys, as he will interview Dr. Trent. Take a look. This will absolutely change your life. Welcome to Ask the Messengers. We're here today with Dr. Calvin Trent. He's the Vice President of Program Development of the Detroit Recovery Project Incorporated and also the Executive Director of Rio, Michigan. We're going to talk about advocacy, prevention, treatment, and recovery in our community. Good. Now, Detroit Recovery Project, also known as DRP. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what DRP is? Well, Detroit Recovery Project is a 501c3 in the city that works primarily in the city of Detroit. Uh, it is an organization that is uh, involved with the health of people uh, and uh, per with particular emphasis on prevention, treatment, and recovery of, of drug addiction. You know, so uh, we provide outpatient treatment, we provide recovery support services. And we provide prevention for youth in our community. Uh, so we're a very important uh, organization in terms of addressing the problem of drug addiction in our community. REAL, R-E-A-L, right. stands for Recovery, Education, Advocacy, and Leadership. That's correct. Now, what is REAL? Or is it REAL Michigan or... How is well, Rio is, is another organization that is a sister organization with not only Detroit Recovery Project, but all the treatment and prevention projects in our community. And Rio um, is about advocacy and it's about supporting the work around substance abuse and addictions in our community. You know, this is one of the most serious problems we face in our community. And it's not just now, it's been a serious problem for many years. Uh, the drugs change, but our people in our community becoming addicted to whether it's heroin, cocaine, uh, marijuana, alcohol, you know, has been a important and horrible health crisis, you know, because um, people get addicted and they lose everything. They don't support their families and, you know, uh, people need to know that uh, we need to address our community and our politicians to make sure that we have the resources to address that problem. Yeah, it broke my relationship with my family. It caused my life to be unmanageable. Um, I wasn't able to do a lot, but wanted to use drugs a lot. My family, we're all in the lifestyle. My family used drugs, used drugs. At 17, I left home because of my family and, you know, my dad, and a lot of chaos in the family. We had murders, we was on TV, it was a lot. So I left home, 
and I was smoking a lot of weed, and I found someone to take care of me, the club owner. And um, I was on my own. Okay, now how are these organizations, the Detroit Recovery Project and Real Michigan, uh, are they the same or are they different or? Well, they're different. You know, they're sister organizations. Uh, uh, Detroit Recovery Project actually provides treatment and recovery support services. Okay. Uh, Real Michigan actually advocates, which means the word advocacy means standing up for something you believe in. You know, uh, we don't get dollars just out of the blue. We get dollars because people understand that there's a crisis going on and we have to dedicate resources to that. Right now we have this heroin epidemic that's mm -hmm. going on and we have just hundreds and thousands of people across the United States and in our community that are overdosing on heroin. Uh, and it's a serious health problem in our community. So, so why would you say that the media has uh, really kicked up the uh, awareness or the coverage? Why? Be, well, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons. One of the main reasons, though, in my mind, is, is that the heroin addiction is really uh, being focused these days in rural communities and white communities, just to be honest. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, when you see uh, suburban schools, high schools, where kids are ODing in the high schools, then that makes the problem even bigger than if it's happening primarily just in the urban communities. Right. That's just the fact of life and, and, and things that we do. So uh, it's affecting more people, and it's affecting more people in the majority population. Right. And that's why the emphasis is kicked up now. It's pretty much every day on the news. It's every day on yeah, the news, it and it's morning. serious. Yeah. It's, a, it's a terrible crisis. I've been in active addiction for about 10 years. It started when I was probably about 17 or 18, and uh, it just progressed further and further until it wasn't any fun anymore. I was at a place where I had no family, no friends, lost my job. I was living on the streets. All my hopes and dreams, I was a hopeless person, and I, uh, I just came, I was sitting on a log one day in the pouring rain looking at my tent I was sleeping in, and uh, I just sat there, and I didn't want to live anymore, and I could feel this pain inside of me, and I, I guess at that moment I just, you know, kind of like said a prayer and asked for some help, and um, I had a moment of clarity but I just realized that I was better than this and there's got to be more to life than what I was doing. The worst day I ever had using drugs other than waking up with a hangover was when I did the, uh, when I was doing my crystal meth binge and I can remember on the come down, my heart would stop beating and I would wake myself up and force myself to breathe and just saying, if I die, I die, but I'm not calling an ambulance and getting stuck with the bill, so I might as well just tough it out and get through this. And that scared the crap out of me, or trying to OD in that um, after my first hip surgery on prescription pills. That was a scary experience. What made me quit was I was tired of the life I was living. I was tired of disappointing myself and disappointing my family and not living up to my potential. So I just decided to take a step back and try to see if living this clean way would actually help any or if it was still just all in my head. So I gave it a shot uh, five months ago. And when people are dying, you know, it's the responsibility to help people to, to fix that. Drug addiction is a health problem. Right. You know, a lot of people don't know that it's a health problem. They think it's just a a bad decisions problem, a moral problem. The person is just bad, you know. Mm -hmm. But no, uh, it is a health problem. Uh, addictions are health problems, mental health problems, behavioral health problems that also affect physical health uh, and affect the economy in our community, you know, because as people get the disease, then they become less productive. They don't work. They don't support their families, and that costs everybody. In Detroit, heroin and cocaine are the two major drugs of abuse, while heroin and prescription opioids are the major drugs of abuse across the state of Michigan. We'll be right back with more of Ask the Messengers. 
God's World, a Detroit institution at West 7 Mile in Schaefer says, get them while they last. The Obama's 2017 commemorative calendar is going fast. Get your church supplies, communion cups, tied envelopes, Bibles, inspirational books by top authors. Call in your orders at 313-862-8220. Shop online at godsworldsuperstore.org. God's World, for all your inspirational needs. Hi, I'm Ashley Greaser, the office manager at Premier Supportive Services. Here at Premier, we offer a variety of services that include residential service, 24-hour residential, attended care, semi-independent, as well as many other services. So if you know of anyone that has been involved in a car accident, we are located at 17555 James Cousin, Suite 2. Or you can give us a call at 313-345-3668. Welcome back to the show. This is Ask the Messengers. Again, I am your host, Pastor Lester Lewis. And again, I have absolutely been blessed by what I have heard from Dr. Trent. He shared some great information. And listen, he's got even more to come. But we want you to know, uh, please, if you haven't already done so, invite a friend, tell somebody, tune in right now, because it's about to get even better. So Dr. Trent is going to share some more information about substance abuse prevention and recovery. And so right now we're going to go back to David Humphreys as, as he interviews Dr. Trent so that you can hear the rest of this testimony. Now back to our show. Okay. Let's talk about peer support services. Right. And uh, what are peers? Well, uh, within um, uh, the addiction community, peers are people in recovery uh, who are helping other people in recovery. So peers are people who have had a lived experience of having a drug addiction. That's what peers are. Uh, how do they fit within the health system? Uh, one of the things that, you know, as a clinical psychologist working with addicts on the treatment side, you know, I always knew that as we provide treatment, Many times people, when they go into a residential treatment program, uh, they stop using. They're, they're not using while they're in there. But when they go back to the environment, when they go back home many times, uh, they are not successful living in the community as a drug-free person. You know, this is a big problem, you know, at, because a person can't stay in the treatment center for the rest right. of their life, you know. And uh, to understand that you can recover and to understand the process from another person's perspective helps you do it too. Something told me to come to treatment and that's why I'm here today. About a month ago, I was using and my grandkids walked in on me. And I think that's the day I realized that it was time to go get some help. If you're out there struggling on drugs, the best thing to do is go to treatment today. Listen to what they have to say because it do works. I'm feeling much, much better today of who I am and where I want to go. At Detroit Recovery Project, um, I would say 85% of the people that work at Detroit Recovery Project are people in long-term recovery which is very, very important. Yeah, they have that knowledge. Right, and, the, and when a person, uh, you know, there's a lot of stigma on, on being an addict, you know, whether it's in your family or wherever, you know, crackhead, you know, druggy, you know, people are, they, you know, takes a long time for people to rebuild trust, you know, and so it's very important for people uh, in early recovery to be associated with a group of people that respect them mm -hmm. and support them in what they do. In 2016, the federal budget for substance abuse and mental health services was $3.7 billion, an increase of $45 million from 2015. Funding is very important. You know, if we don't have the money, we can't provide the treatment. Right. And that's why advocacy is so important. Okay. Because in our community, we need to let our leadership know that we need, that this is a serious problem, which they know, and that we need the resources to be able to provide the treatment to people that need it and the uh, other services. 
Well, why don't you just quit? You know, I've had that experience in my life before I began to work in the addiction field. I've had many people in my family that were addicted to heroin, uh, to, you know, over the years. And actually, I never knew that people recovered because my experience was that everybody in my family who was addicted went to prison or died from their addiction. You know, there was no happy story for addiction in my particular family. Mm -hmm. But one of the great uh, uh, things that happened in my life was I became acquainted with the recovery community and I began to see that people actually do recover. Not only do they recover, that they become great decision makers and great leaders in our community. And we need to encourage that and advocate for the treatment for these people. You know, because many times people don't realize or don't understand that recovery is possible. You know, when you're dealing with a child or a mom or a dad or a brother, you know, that is exhibiting the behaviors that addicts do, right. you know, uh, because of their brain disease, you know, the lying, the stealing, the cheating, the prostitution, all those things, you know, then... Um, you begin to think that this person can't be helped, that this is just going to be what they do, and I just need to divorce myself from them. Maybe. But there is a chance for recovery. There's a, a lot of hope. There are hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people, who are successfully in recovery and have turned their lives around. And that's the story we don't get to hear as much. And that's what Rio wants to do, make right. sure that our community, that's why we're here today, Make sure that people in our community know that recovery is possible. Okay. We're here with Dr. Calvin Trent. He's the Vice President of Program Development for Detroit Recovery Project Incorporated and also Executive Director of Real Michigan. We'll be right back with more of Ask the Messengers. Stay tuned for more of Ask the Messengers. Hi, I'm Ashley Greaser, the Office Manager at Premier Supportive Services. Here at Premier, we offer a variety of services that include residential service, 24-hour residential, attended care, semi-independent, as well as many other services. So if you know of anyone that has been involved in a car accident, we are located at 17555 James Cousin, Suite 2. Or you can give us a call at 313-345-3668. God's World. A Detroit institution at West 7 Mile in Schaefer says, get them while they last. The Obama's 2017 commemorative calendar is going fast. Get your church supplies, communion cups, pine envelopes, Bibles, inspirational books by top authors. Call in your orders at 313-862-8220. Shop online at godsworldsuperstore.org. God's World for all your inspirational needs. We're back on Ask the Messengers, and we have Dr. Calvin Trent with us. And we've been talking about recovery, prevention, right. advocacy, some, you know, prevention and things. So I know that you have a high success rate for helping people to recover. Mm -hmm. But it's harder for some people to recover, say harder than others. Why right. is that? Well, you know, there's, uh, you know, people in their recovery need support. And many times the level of support is different for different people. You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, we'll find people who have good social support. They have a, a supportive family. The people are still with them and still able to support them and provide them resources. Mm -hmm. Your sister might be willing to let you stay with her or your brother or, you know, uh, uh, many people don't have that social support. They don't have, uh, uh, they burn so many bridges perhaps that they don't have that kind of support. That hurts a person who, you know, is trying to recover. They need those kind of supports. Also financial supports. You know, there are some people who have SSI or have some kind of financial resources coming in. You know, when you don't have those kind of financial resources, that makes your recovery more difficult too. Okay. You know, so there are other things around the person that and just hope you know, that there's somebody in your life that's there that you can talk to and support you. And sometimes you know, people who are close to you want to support you, but they become enablers. They actually 
defeating the purpose by heaven. Well, I, you know, at the, many times at the beginning of recovery, uh, when the person is still kind of out there and still using and you're giving them money and helping them, you know, and they're using, then that's enabling. At the end of the process, once they've got treatment and mm -hmm. they're coming back into the community, yes, you do want to help them. Right. You know, as long as they're doing the right thing. So that's not enabling at that point. You know, and what helps one person be successful generally mm -hmm. is that they do have the supports around them. And that's what Recovery Support Services is. Okay. We want to help them get their dental care. We want to help them get mental health services. We want to help them get back with their family, you know, and live a normal life. Because most of them want to, right? Yeah, but it, it, it's a process. You know, uh, many times we find, like, I'm a family member, and that's why I'm in this. Because, you know, I didn't really know that recovery was possible. But now that I know that recovery is possible, you know, and I see somebody who has put the time in and the dedication to go to treatment, you know, then I want to help them at that time. You know, this is the time to get in there and become an asset to them. Okay. You know, and that's what I want all the families to know. You know, that uh, once the person has put that commitment in, you know, don't deny them then. All right. Deny them the $5 to go get a rock. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But when they're, when they've, completed their treatment process and they come back, you know, this is a time to support them, help them get a job, you know, just don't let them be back out there again. Okay. And, and that's the message for uh, us and uh, us family members and us supporters that recovery is possible and it really does happen. It's got to get in your mind and when we know that, then we want to help them and we help them in many ways. Okay. Let's talk about elections. Yeah. The political structure. Um, does the recovery community need to vote? And if so, why? Well, the, the conversation we just had. Yes, recovery. I mean, people, you know, recovery uh, advocacy is about supporting something you believe in. You know, uh, whatever it is. You know, I believe in recovery. I believe that, that people who have suffered with an addiction need help to continue their recovery, you know, and I'm an advocate for that. I believe that, you know, and so I need, so people need to have the help and the resources. A lot of times, one example for you, David, is a lot of times people will, uh, because of their addiction, go to jail, get a felony, you know, and when they get out, they go for a job, and the first thing on the job application is, have you ever had a felony? And when you check that box, they throw your application in the trash. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That is a political decision to have that question on there. You know, I mean, and we in the city of Detroit have advocated to not have that question on our on the um, applications. On the applications anymore. Wow. So it makes it easier. So when we find areas where people don't have, uh, where the politics or the laws are hindering their recovery, then we need to be advocates to change those laws. So you're talking about the uh, recovery community, making their voices heard? And, and Not only the voice. recovery community. One, I think it's important for the recovery community uh, because, you know, as I've worked with people in recovery, many times they're discovering new things. I mean, I, I, I took a, a 45 year old guy uh, to register to vote. He had never been registered to vote in 45 years. It was amazing to me. But a lot of people, because of their addiction, and you know, have not done those things that we think are, are basically normal. So yes, the recovery community needs to know they now, when they're in recovery, have power, and they can exercise that power through voting. You know, you can vote for a city council person or a mayor or something that supports you and supports recovery. Okay, so what, what can politicians do to help well, uh, the, in the prevention and recovery process? The main things is, is two things, I think. One is what they call the bully pulpit. And that means you can have a, a representative that speaks up about this issue. You know, 
not in terms of putting more people in jail, but in terms of letting people know this is a health issue. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's a public health issue. And, and we need to support people getting the proper treatment and recovery. So, so do you ever bring the politicians in with you, like town hall meetings and things? Oh yeah, we that? yeah we we uh, uh, always our main job at Real is educating politicians and educating the community, like we're doing now, about what they can do to okay. help people, uh, their own family members. There's no family that I know of that's not been affected by addiction in one way or another. You know, most of the time we just don't know what to do, you know. But right now we have a problem with some politicians wanting to remove uh, health care from people. That the Obamacare covered 24 million people. Many of them were people with addictions. You know, if that, if we don't support uh, uh, the Obamacare, then these people are going to be back out there again without the resources to get treatment. That's a terrible thing. Yes, it is. You know, and that's what we <coughs> want to advocate for. And that's why everybody in our community who cares about this issue should know where people stand and vote. So if you're in recovery and you're having any problems, if you got out of treatment and you need support, call Detroit Recovery Project. That's what we're here for. We're right. here to help you. We're here with Dr. Trent. Thank you very much for Thank your valuable you, information. I'm sure you're going to help save some lives out there. That's what it's all about. And thanks to Ask the Messenger. Thank you for tuning in to Ask the Messengers. We need your financial support to keep this program on the air. Would you please send your tax-deductible donation to Greater Love Christian Center? Attention, Ask the Messengers. 18400 Schaefer Highway. Detroit, Michigan, 48235. And for online donations, please visit our website at www.askthemessengers.com. It is our prayer that through the message of this show, that you would be led to a God of your own understanding that would help you find that place of peace. We'll see you next time on Ask the Messengers. Tune in again. Hi, I'm Ashley Greaser, the Office Manager at Premier Supportive Services. Here at Premier, we offer a variety of services that include residential service, 24-hour residential, attended care, semi-independent, as well as many other services. So if you know of anyone that has been involved in a car accident, we are located at 17555 James Cousin, Suite 2, or you can give us a call at 313-345-3668.